Welcome back to our third episode in Pacific Horticulture's series on the Climate Ready Plants Trial. Six Western universities and institutions have been working together to help identify beautiful, low water use plants for creating inspiring, sustainable landscapes for a changing climate. This pioneering collaboration has been so successful, it sparked new projects and avenues of research. Today, we'll hear about some of the top performers, a new climate trial, a graduate study, and new directions in breeding drought-tolerant plants. By measuring the same plants under controlled levels of irrigation across the six sites, scientists are discovering exactly how the plants react under varied conditions. After a year of full irrigation to become established, the plants are each evaluated for one season. Along with the research, the public gets its chance to vote for favorites at open houses held at each of the sites. Up until now, there was no data that, that said, that, you know, this, this quote unquote water wise plant, how drought tolerant is it? People are impressed to see the performance under the real life conditions. And we, we try to mimic commercial landscape conditions and they're pretty rough. We don't really, um, we, we do not do any supplemental fertilizing. We do only hand weeding and um, we have the mulching in order to conserve soil moisture and mainly for us for weed suppression, of course. But otherwise we do an absolute minimum on pruning. And um, when there is pest and disease, we don't do any treatments. And that is really good because it helps us to evaluate the true potential under our climatic conditions. The best performing plants at our site here in Aurora, Oregon, from year one, the first plantings were the roses. The roses had a really long bloom period. In our world, there were no differences between any of the drought treatments. So the very low water looked just as good as the sufficiently watered. And the, the color and shape and growth looked great. And so they rated the highest by the community evaluation on our field day. Uh, people thought they looked really good. Um, another performer, which didn't rate as highly on the field day, um, and that had to do with the timing of our field day, which was in August, was the rosemary. We did an upright variety of a rosemary, and it had no issues with low water. And for, for us on the research team that we're evaluating, the blooms were really strong early, brought in pollinators, and just looked great overall. So the rosemary and the roses did the best at our Oregon site. We are doing a couple different nine bark, so physocarpus in our new study. So this is early data, but those are looking beautiful. They're looking really um, robust. They leafed out early and well, so they seem to not have been affected by the cold like the others. They bloomed already. Um, again, we don't have the drought data on them, but just that nice dark foliage. So we have two that have similar names. We have Little Devil and we have Diabolo in our trials. Um, and they're these, these compact, small uh, nine barks, but they're looking really good early. I think native plants, um, which is different for each landscape, get uh, attention, like maybe the idea, especially in the West, that these are going to be the drought tolerant ones. But then there are a lot of ornamental varieties that have been selected from places that have drought backgrounds that also do really well. So our Ceanothus did really well but our Vitex also did really well. And that's a plant that's selected from a very dry environment, but is not native to the area. But, you know, looks robust, foliage is nice, blooms nice. Rosemary, the common herb, I mentioned that as one of the, the successes. That does great in a landscape, but it's from, you know, the Mediterranean, the European Mediterranean climate. One thing that I think that as we expanded multi-state, that we realized is that timing matters. So I think as far as like, as a team, as a process, we're learning that there's an overall project vision, 
But then there's also definitely site specific nuance where you have to take into account what's going on in your site. I think another thing that we learned um, again was field management. So we have a lot higher weed pressure, weeds in our site up here because it does rain for so much longer. So anytime we um, we cultivate or turn over the soil, we're also turning over weed seeds. But then if we get spring rains, boom, weeds come back. Again, these drier sites, so Arizona, Davis, potentially Utah, um, even Southern, Southern California, the Irvine site, some of the practices that they established and then advised for us needed to be different. So like the UC Davis site mulches, and that's enough to suppress weeds. That is not enough for us. You know, so we have to constantly be going through cultivating, mulching, working the field for a lot longer. So again, these site-specific differences are something that we're learning as a team and bringing in. And we do hope to continue the project for multiple years now that we have our site set up. We've learned quite a bit about plants themselves. But what we learned, at least what I learned the most, and it was interesting, was that it is a team effort, right? So the coordination of this large-scale project takes time and needs to build a team. And I think throughout this process, a really nice team has been built that can work together. The process of talking about the, the projects and the plans and what we found I mean, we've been having maybe bi-weekly meetings for the over two years, and we got to learn a lot about each other. And that that was a, a really important aspect of it, so that we can share ideas. Now that the team is built, uh, if you can find a way to move forward, I think that would be awesome. You know, the hardest thing to do is to get the team together and then get the facilities, the infrastructure set up. That's the most difficult step. Now we've got this really cool infrastructure and team where we can do these really cool studies um, that now what uh, we have to do is figure out what new studies can we do to take advantage of, I'll use the word exploit, the, the, the situation that we have and get more money. did have one graduate student um, work on this project as a thesis. Her name was Alison Frohn. And what she did was to pick five taxa, a common taxa across sites, and she analyzed those five taxa and finished her master's. We're now working on finalizing a thesis and turning that into a manuscript for a journal of submission. So, we are in that process. So it's almost there. So we haven't really finished all 15 taxa analysis yet, but of the five common taxa that we had across the sites, all of them did pretty well. It was a little bit of a surprise for us because we were expecting to see some differences at least between high and low treatment, but uh, we did not see that difference. And especially when we were looking at sites like really um, hot and dry sites compared to the northern sites where we had um, in Seattle as well as in Portland area. We did get funding to also include uh, a studies on vines. People, architects, uh, uh, landscape architects might specify the use of vines to placed near buildings and specifically to mitigate thermal loads. Uh, they grow faster than trees that, that might do the same thing. But no one's really looked at what the water cost is for these vines. And that's what we want to do. So Climate Red Vines project is the follow-up project, utilizing in our case, the same plot that we used for the current project. So it's going to be quite similar, but for this one, we will go on for the next two years. Another project, related project, is Ryan Contreras at Oregon State. He brought up, well, you know, there's some evidence that polyploidy has some connotations to water stress for drought resistance, but we really don't know. So that's something we're going to test because we have our experiment, our field setup is just for that kind of study. 
Um, so we're going to put in pairs of plants, um, you know, lower ploidy versus higher ploidy plants of the same species and see if there's a difference in water use. I see the future of plant trialing going into something that's really aimed toward producing climate resilient plants that people actually want to put in their gardens. I think our results are pointing to the need for plant breeders to uh, be developing resilient plants that can be tolerant of, uh, of, of these temperature extremes as well as these moisture extremes. And this isn't something that's new and the plant breeding process, especially for woody ornamentals, is something that can be on a, a decadal scale, but definitely is multi-year. Um, it's, it's different than, let's say, like an annual, like a bedding plant. And so as a scientific community and, you know, as a culture, we've been aware that climate change is, is, is something to be addressed for the past 30 years, 40 years, right? You know, there have been alarm bells. And so plant breeders have been focusing on this already. So that's the good thing. There are already plants in the pipeline. Um, and then trials like ours that are on these huge latitudinal gradients covering the West, um, they're providing sort of the empirical evidence. Um, they're providing the engagement with growers, with you know plant people to come out and see it. What we know from the genetics is that the different traits that may be important in plant survival, such as uh, resistance to drought, resistance to salinity, and resistance to heat stress, um, they are usually linked to different genes and not necessarily to the same ones. And so I think um, it will not be um, that easy. And I think there will always be some field testing required in order to make sure that the plants will withstand some of those really critical um, environmental conditions that we are encountering and that we will be encountering. And so it's kind of uh, reinforcing this theory, this concept that like, look, plants are going to be struggling in different ways. And then having these trials where people can visit at all these different research sites, um, I think is really helping, you know, highlight that the importance of that of that stress tolerance. The things that I would hope is that the industry, our, our big industry partners in particular, have really begun to see the value of the trials when it comes to their ability to market. They're using our logos in their national advertising campaigns and on their websites. Star Roses in their 2024 catalog, they have a whole page on drought resistant roses and it's got you know, tested at the University of California on, at the top of the page. I think it um, helps nurseries and landscape um, companies when they are selling plants or when they are specking plants um, for new designs and such. It helps them to make choices that are based on actual research. And I think in the future, some of this will be important to project which plants may migrate to other climate zones. Because UC Davis is already looking at a lot of the plants that we're growing successfully here in the Sonoran Desert. The lead PI, kind of the visionary of this, Lauren Oki at Davis, I mean, he has this nursery background and a landscape ecology background and so he's seeing all of it and how it matters to bring the pieces together rather than just you know these individual parts of it so maybe the plant grows really well in the nursery but then you put it out in the landscape and it doesn't do what people hoped for it or vice versa maybe it could look beautiful but it just is hard in propagation and production and so those things are really important for making, you know, resilient and successful landscapes. It's not just one stage. Big team, the big picture has been amazing. Yeah, and so Ryan's group, I believe it was Althea. Um, so with our uh, Hibiscus syriacus, they were they were doing this ploidy manipulation um, again. And then one of his grad students, and this is already published, so people could reach out and read it. Um, they noticed that the stomata count on the bottom was fewer. That's why this collaboration is so great. Why I'm so excited to, you know, to have Lloyd at o Oregon State and, and be part of this larger project is we're putting, uh, you know, quantitative values to the these things that we 
well, we think that we are going to increase drought stress to some degree by increasing ploidy, which we're already, you know, we're doing that to breed for uh, reduced fertility in these plants. We think that it's going to increase drought stress, but this is actually giving, uh, you know, credence to that. Some decades ago, there started to be a pendulum shift towards genetics and genomics, and you see it reflected in the scientific literature. And I like to think that there's a little bit of a pendulum shift back toward, well, wait, we, we still need to understand the fundamental mechanisms of what's going on inside the plant. Ploidy is a big foundation for my program. So ploidy is simply the number of chromosome sets that an, uh, an organism has. So humans are diploid or diploid, uh, which means that we have two sets. We consider most plants to be diploid, but really as we dig into the science, every angiosperm we think has undergone what we call a whole genome duplication. So there's over evolutionary time, there's been duplications of the, the, the chromosome sets as we've gone along. We're using ploidy manipulation. So we're changing the number of chromosome sets that plants have, mainly to uh, impact their level of fertility and to reduce fertility because we want nursery crops that grow where we plant them, but don't escape cultivation and go out into natural areas. So in hibiscus, in maples, in barberry, in spirea, um, yeah, there's a, a long list of plants for which we're developing these odd ploides. And uh, I think it's a really great opportunity for the green industry as a whole. We are continuing to market more of these uh, plants that present less ecological threat by escaping cultivation. Now they're also, the, you've got this value added. A, they're a known commodity for growers and consumers. So consumers ask for these plants by name, growers know how to grow them well. And now we can release plants uh, to the industry that have more tolerance to drought conditions. So consumers have to use less water to, to grow them in their home landscapes as we're moving more toward low input landscapes. So that, that I think is the, the thing that makes me most excited. And so that wasn't something that he was breeding towards, but then if we're looking at again, well, plants lose 300 molecules of water compared to absorbing one molecule of CO2. So they're essentially just breathing out all this water vapor, right? So they're losing all this water. And then he's developing these plants that are, have fewer holes. So, you know, the ship is less leaky. Then what's that do for drought tolerance? So did he breed a beautiful stress tolerant plant that's now also sterile? You know, that's the question that we're answering. So the answer was yes, also. So spoiler alert, but yeah, it, <laughs> it bloomed well. Um, it looks great. I think it will help create an impetus to get these low fertility polyploid cultivars into the hands of consumers. I think it could be picked up and marketed by the green industry. You know, you think about the, the blueberry industry and how much they've latched on to, you know, superfoods, nutraceuticals, the uh, importance of anthocyanins and, you know, cancer prevention and things. And Nothing is better for human health than to sequester carbon and evolve oxygen. And that's what our products do. And if we can do that in a way, if we can promote products that do that while using less water uh, and not escaping cultivation, I, I think we're, we're entering a golden age. I think the impact of the project, and I think we're already seeing it, is highlighting these plants that maybe didn't get as much attention so we saw um, some of our grower collaborators taking the results from our study and using it in their marketing and being like, hey, this is working. So stomata are the pores that plants use for gas exchange, um, taking in CO2 and releasing water vapor. And that we were looking at it from the point of view of um, whether there are differences in those um, stomata morphology for the plants that have been bred in different ways. One of the areas that we are looking into in terms of linking to plant breeding is where we're going. Um, so linking the breeding effort with the plant performance and the physiological aspect. Um, if we can go further into this, that would be great. Another thing that, that I think would be great that we didn't get to do with this project is to look at the root, root morphology or root systems. I think what we find is that a lot of plants are doing quite well because of the plasticity that they have 
in their root system when they are not irrigated enough that they are able to go deeper into the lower layers of the soil. And I think that's an important, I guess, target trait for breeding as well. So we can we can look into that. Um, that would be my hope that we can get to do. Climate ready landscapes start with the right plants. Knowing how plants perform in various locations and treatments is key to selecting plants that will thrive in your sustainable landscape while conserving water. And that's a powerful new tool the Climate Ready Landscape trial has developed. But even more impactful may be the example shown by this systemic, multidisciplinary teamwork. Having come together, this team across six Western states found they could do more inspiring doctoral work, the upcoming vines study, and whole new directions in breeding that could help generations of gardeners. Climate change is too complex an issue to be solved in silos. This team found that sharing information and perspectives across industries and constituencies is a powerful driver for holistic change that works. Thank you for watching. Please share this video and follow Pacific Horticulture for follow-ups on this work and more information to help you garden wisely.